Okay, everyone, we're going to look at part three of our episode on Jesus' words on salvation, chapter two, entitled The Repentant Goes Home, Justified, and the Shallowly Righteous Does Not. This is from Luke 18. And the sub issue of this video is Does God justify the ungodly, those who are unrepentant of sin? And we will begin now. Okay, let's just recap where we had left off. We were talking about Genesis 15, 6, and we're Paul quotes this in Romans, but when you look at Genesis 15, 6, even in the King James Version, you see it doesn't say what Paul says. It says, and he, Abraham, believed in the Lord. Get rid of this semicolon. There is no punctuation in Hebrew. And he believed in the Lord, and there is no he here, and counted it to him for righteousness. So who is being right, deemed righteous? God, Yahweh. So Abraham believed him, believed God, and counted it to him. Yahweh as righteousness. God was righteous towards Abraham by being good to him and giving him a son in old age. That's all it was. And we showed you this is the error Paul had was caused by the Septuagint. This is what Septuagint looks like for this passage. And you'll see it says Abraham trusted in God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. No, no, no. <laughs> it was counted to God as a righteous deed. That's what that says. And um, And then we have to obey God's word, which is if anyone speaks contrary to the law and testimony and the Torah, see that word law? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Well, this passage of Genesis 15, 6, if you didn't know it, is the first book of the law. So Paul speaks contrary. <laughs> they speak not according to this word. There is therefore no light. Once you mistake what the meaning of the words are on the page, you are misled. And Paul then misleads millions and billions of people because that's become the doctrine of justification in place of Jesus's doctrine of justification and God's doctrine of justification. So now we're going to pick up where we left off. And we, we went through Mr. Gaston saying the same thing about what I just said. He, Abraham, put his trust in Yahweh and he, Abraham, counted to him Yahweh for righteous, that righteousness. So it's God's righteousness that was uh, praised by Abraham. That's all. It wasn't God accounting the a belief as a righteous act of Abraham, and now he's going to heaven for that belief. And uh, Professor Hamilton said the same thing. If you follow just what? If you follow normal Hebrew syntax, in which the subject of the first clause is presumed to continue to the next clause. So the subject is he, and he believed in the Lord and counted it to him. The subject of counted has to be the same person who's the he here. Abraham. Abraham counted to the Lord. So it's not the... Lord accrediting or giving righteousness to Abraham for having believed in this very nice, generous act of God to give him a son in old age. Think what he, the, the topic that's to be believed is just simply God said, I'm going to give you a child in old age. Somehow, do you believe by, by this, merely Abraham believing God meant what he's meant? That somehow that made Abraham a righteous person? It's silly, actually. The, the mistake Paul made is silly to even suggest because it wouldn't make sense in the context. But we know it doesn't have to mean that at all because it's logically means exactly what Professor Hamilton is saying. This he, in normal Hebrew syntax, is understood, doesn't have to be stated, and it remains the subject of counted. And Abraham believed in the Lord and counted to him, Yahweh, as a righteous act. That's all it was. Now, but that's important because, you know, don't minimize these issues as I show them to you because <laughs> everyone around you needs to be educated. They're just so uh, misled and think that everything Paul says can be able to redefine the Bible. No, but Paul is tested by what came before him and he's inconsistent with what came before him. And if they'll say, well, the Bible was corrupted, well, then they got to prove that. They got to show you how it was corrupted. And like I just showed you, if you just use common sense, you would know there was a mistake by Paul because someone believing in that God's going to follow through on a promise to give you a child of old age, how would believing that fact make you morally justified, give, make you a righteous person. That doesn't make any sense. Belief itself never and of itself makes you saved. And that's why James said, do you think the demons are going to heaven because they believe in God? They, if God made a threat on them, they know and they believe God too. <laughs> they would believe his threats or promises are true. and But they would shudder in fear because they're going to be destroyed. But but that doesn't make them saved because they would believe God is going to follow through. I mean, that's the insanity. I'm sorry to use that word, but it's insane to think this premise of Paul makes any sense. And that's how you shouldn't have known or anyway. God's going to say to everybody who says, oh, I thought it was maybe corruption. No, no, no. God's going to say, did you use your brain? I gave you a brain. I made a terrific brain in you. How could a belief that I was going to give somebody a child in old age made him 
somehow righteous, just believing in that fact. Does that make any sense? And he's going to, I think that's how God's going to cross examine every one of us who come up with ridiculous ideas that he's going to just dismiss and destroy. You have to have a defense in front of God. You're not going to just sit there and walk through like you think. He's, it's going to be a tough battle. You may get through if you can convince God. Look how many times Abraham uh, got God to say, God, if there's 50 righteous people, will you not destroy this city? Well, okay, uh, you know, not maybe, whatever. Yeah, okay, 50. All right, I'll do 50. Then he says, what about 25? Th that, God says, all right, all right, I'll do 25. Then he says, will you do 10? All right, that's it, 10. <laughs> so you can maybe prove to God you had some common sense in this. So make it that decision now. Can you defend the, uh, some belief by Abraham that he believed God was going to give him a child in old age, the prior verse, that that somehow belief gave him an intrinsic benefit that God is going to say, you're righteous. You're going to heaven. You believed I'm going to give you a child in old age. Can you defend that plausibly to God? That you got to sit now and dream, pray to God all night long. Can you defend that? And if you can't, then ask yourself why you and millions of other people before you just gullibly accept what Paul says without testing. And you see, I've shown you two big, big dogs, a Presbyterian pastor and a big dog uh, translator. Hamilton, they both agree what I'm saying to you is the, what it reads. That's what it says, what I told you. Abraham believed God and counted it to God as a righteous thing. All right, now let's get back to where we were, where we left off last time. Table two, justification in Ezekiel 18. Good deeds lose value when you sin. A mirror of the parable of the publican and the Pharisees. Okay, so that's the parable we're dealing with in Luke 18. So I, I put on one side, the left side of justified issues and unjustified on the right side. So let's listen. This is Ezekiel 18, verse 27 to 28, ASV, justified. Again, when the wicked man turns away from his wickedness that he has committed and does that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive because he considers and turns away from all his transgressions that he has committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. All right. Easy peasy to figure what that's saying. You repent. God will forgive what you've done and he'll forget what you've done in the past. That's how you get grace. You have to turn from your sin. Oh, but that sounds like earning salvation. I don't care what Paul says in derision of this principle. You can't get away from it. It's a prophet Ezekiel. Is Paul better than Ezekiel? Ezekiel actually quotes Yahweh is talking to him. And, and Jesus adopts Ezekiel and all the law and prophets. You don't have a prayer if you're going to tell God on judgment day, well, I thought Paul could trump Ezekiel. He's going to go, did he ever quote me? And by the way, that's a key criteria in Jeremiah 35. If God is not being quoted, and unless you have a, a, an exceptional situation where God has previously said someone is uh, speaking for God, and Jesus has that in the baptismal account and in the transfiguration accounts, where Yahweh speaks from heaven twice in the, in the New Testament, by the way, over people, over Jesus' head in front of multiple witnesses to say something that makes his words invested with authority automatically. But everybody, every other prophet, according to Jeremiah 35, has to have a quote of Yahweh. And if he doesn't, you cannot accept him as a prophet. That's, that is an absolute barrier to Paul. No, and he has no God speaking over his head that people have heard. Other witnesses were present who heard the words that said, we have to listen to Paul. And there is none. There was no witnesses on the road to Damascus who said, we don't even know their names. We have no, we, nobody has ever heard who, who these people were. So totally, totally uh, uh, baseless to believe what Paul said you have to follow because he never quotes Yahweh. He never quotes, he doesn't even quote Jesus. Okay, he only quotes Jesus in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, where Jesus says, I'm not going to release you. his Jesus says, I'm not going to release you from a torment of an angel of Satan. Go look it up in the Greek. Go to Mount C's Transliteral. Look at the words. <laughs> I will not release you from an, a torment of an angel of Satan, because in your weakness is my strength. You know, the power comes from your weakness, basically. I'm going to leave you subject to this. And Paul interprets it twice that Jesus, his Jesus did this to keep him humble. Why in the world would the real Jesus have ever left under anyone under the torment and of angel of Satan? Think about it and look again. Look at Mount C's transliteral. Look at the words in Greek, angelos satanas, an angel of Satan, the top dog. Not a little demon, not a sub-lieutenant way down at the low, low pecking order. The top dogs next to, <laughs> next to Satan, an angel of Satan. Anyway, so let's go over the unjustified. How are you unjustified? 
But when the righteous, by the way, Paul says there's no no or none righteous, right? Well, that's false. That was a, he was reading a psalm out of context. Here you have proof there is righteous people because Ezekiel is t- telling us, God tells us there are righteous people. But when the righteous, that God, Yahweh is saying, there are people who are righteous, when the righteous turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live. None of his righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered. In his trespass, he has trespassed in his sin that he has sinned, in them he shall die. Meaning this person, when he dies physically, will be dead spiritually forever, tormented, and whatever God's punishments are, he's going to suffer that. So you right, there are righteous people, by the way. That this verse tells you that. Paul just reads out of context. And that's another thing. You've got to test these things that when you read what Paul's saying, go pull up the verses there. If you go to the W E B Bible at uh, BibleGateway.com, they always give you the footnotes, what the corresponding verses are that are cross-referenced. And that's a way to check uh, out and verify whether Paul is telling you the truth or he's misled, or maybe he could even be deceiving you. You don't know. You have to test him, right? Let's continue. Justification in Ezekiel 18. Good deeds will lose value when you sin. A mirror of the parable of the publican and the Pharisees. So let's look at the publican and the Pharisee. The justified column. Publican, publican turns from wickedness, right? He repented from sin. So that fits in the justified category of Ezekiel 18. Let's look at the guy who goes home unjustified. The Pharisee recites obedience to lesser commands of tithing and to oral law on fasting. So Pharisee did what? He failed to repent of sin. He, did he, he didn't say anything about, you know, reviewed his life and said he did anything wrong. So that's not a good way of praying when you sit down with God and you want to pray. You have to pray about those things that today you did not do what you should have done and repent of them or other ongoing issues that you need to repent from. It's not it's not going to help you to just bear. God's not ignorant of our sins, so we have to confess them. MacArthur's spin to prove this parable teaches justification by faith alone. John MacArthur defends a faith alone reading of the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Thus, when MacArthur discusses Jesus' doctrine of justification in this passage, he claims it is compatible with the faith alone doctrine. To accomplish this, MacArthur claims the Pharisees were legalists. Oh, wow. I mean, they they were very rigidly following the law. As proven in the later chapter on the Pharisees, this is a false depiction of the Pharisees. So we have an entire chapter dedicated, 120 pages to disprove this uh, thesis. Uh, I'm just going to tell you what it is in a a nutshell. So it's entitled, Exceeding the Righteousness of the Shallowly Righteous, Matthew 5, verse 20. Um, So we'll get into it a little bit here, but let's keep going. The faith alone interpretation of Jesus' parables, such as MacArthur offers, collapses when we correct the wrong view of the Pharisees upon which his argument relies. Martha begins, MacArthur begins with a wise approach. But the one occasion where Jesus actually declared someone justified provides the best insight into the doctrine as he taught it. Thank you. Thank you. This is the best proof of how one is justified or not. Now, he's going to distort things and bend and twist Jesus to come out sounding like Paul, but that's not going to work. We follow Jesus, whatever he says, and we're not trying to twist things to make Paul look good. Anyway, this is in his article. Jesus' Perspective on Sola Fide, 2004, and this is the HTTP, it's a biblebb.com slash files, mac slash sf dash solafide.htm. This is absolutely the case. The best source of the doctrine on justification should be Jesus. When Jesus declares someone justified, we need to find out why. However, as we shall see, MacArthur will impress on top of Jesus' words foreign ideas to make the foreign ideas palatable and allegedly consistent with what Jesus teaches. Yet those foreign ideas supplant and destroy Jesus' message on justification. To save belief alone for justification, MacArthur commits two misrepresentations. He falsely depicts the publican tax gatherer and the Pharisee. Yet MacArthur initially summarizes this parable accurately. MacArthur states, He, Jesus, also told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, gatherer. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax gatherer, standing alone some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. Why? He is ashamed, right? But was beating his breast. Why is he doing that? Because he's turning his heart away from sin, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. How can he pray for mercy? If you know the law, you can't ask for mercy unless what? You turn back to loving God and obeying his commandments. That's between the first and the second commandment. 
text. Please go look at Exodus 20, verse 6. It says, God says, I extend my mercy to those who love me and obey my commandments. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. So right there, Jesus is telling you the difference is one person is exalting himself, trying to puff himself up, maybe boast even about his good deeds that he hasn't really done. He's just simply saying words to God as if that was going to convince God. That's not how you talk to God. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. No, no. What you do is you say, this is this is what I haven't done and pray, pray that I do more of what I need to be doing, what's good, you know, that kind of thing. But telling God you haven't done something wrong is uh, not anything but bo boasting. That is boasting. But what does the humble do? The humble repents of sin. Now, why can't uh, uh, MacArthur accept this very simple fact? Because he said he summarized it correctly here. Well, he can't because Paul says the Pharisees were totally righteous. Okay, they were the strictest legalists. Why were they not being justified if that's the case here? If they're completely obeying God's law, so that's what he wants to say because that would get back to Paul's doctrine. But Jesus is saying that's not what's going on here. What's happening here is these people are exalting themselves, saying they're uh, really obeying God's law or at least these two things, tithing and uh, tithing is one and the other is fasting. And fasting isn't even a command, it's an oral law to do that, to restrict yourself. So Jesus is not impressed by any of this because it's their own promotion of themselves to God. But the person who says, I'm sinning, I'm, uh, I'm repenting for my sin, I'm sorry for my sin, that person by humbling themselves uh, is justified to, by God. So that is correct. The people who uh, exalt themselves by saying how good they are, are not self-examining. If that's your approach to prayer to God, you will never repent properly because you're not inwardly looking at your flaws. <laughs> it's, if, if you're not, if you're obeying God's uh, commandments, you don't have to tell them that you are. Just, just leave that alone. Just ask for God for more strength to pray. But the Pharisees aren't doing that. They're very, uh, uh, as Jesus said, they're very, law negators. They negate God's law. They have an oral commandment that does away with the fourth commandment to obey your mother and father. They have a, a, a they basically teach only tithing and they neglect all the weightier matters of the law. Mercy. What I just told you, the principle of mercy is I, uh, God will give you mercy. If you love him, you return back to loving him and obey his commandments. That's what he, he says in the 10 commandments. That's where the gospel of grace is in the law. You can ignore it all day long. That's what the Pharisees do. They ignore it. It's right there. It's just, it's fair. It's good. It's not harmful. But you don't boast about whether you are or aren't keeping the law. You basically repent of your sin when you are sinning. And then you, by humbling yourself, you will be deemed justified in God's sight. But anyone who will not humble himself and pray that way and exalts himself to God is goes home unjustified. Do you see the difference? Okay, so to this point, MacArthur is correctly summarizing the parable. So why was the man who repented of sin justified, but the man who failed to do so unjustified? The answer is blaring and obvious. Repentance is key. Sincere repentance is key. However, MacArthur will claim that the one who is unjustified is so because he had successfully engaged in complete obedience to the law. So somebody who actually does exactly everything the law requires goes home unjustified. Do you get that out of reading this, ladies and gentlemen? I don't. It's somebody who's exalting himself that he does keep all the law, but that very act of, of going to God and boasting about everything you did negates all of your good works because now you're boasting about your good works. You'll go to hell. So is the solution what? The solution is to be humble yourself and review your life. Don't tell God all the good stuff you're doing. Tell God the stuff that you need help with. That's what God wants to hear from you, like a good father. The other is you're treating him as like, you know, you're an equal to God, that you act, you can tell him all the good things you're doing. So that's not going to help you. It's repentance is the key, humbling yourself. And with the pre presupposition added, and with that presupposition added to the parable, Jesus means supposedly exposed that perfect obedience cannot impute righteousness or justification to you. No, it says it basically what he's saying. Jesus is saying if you're if you're exalting yourself, you're also sinning. If you're telling God all this wonderful stuff about yourself, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, which is to humble yourself. So there's there's your sin right there. Exaltation versus humbling yourself. Again, why does he miss it? Because he's blind, because he's listening to Paul and he just doesn't he wants to make this come out is somehow about faith. Faith alone, where is that? But he he'll he'll find a way. 
then the justified publican is supposedly justified according to MacArthur because he had been disobedient but now has faith. So, so somehow the publican now has faith that he didn't have faith before. We don't not definitely do not see that in this parable, and hence is justified despite disobedience. So, in other words, MacArthur is saying he, this guy doesn't even change. He's just simply sorrowful. It just simply uh, doesn't doesn't promise or decide he's going to go in a new direction. He's just simply sad that he sinned. That's not what you're supposed to think. And he had faith, though. He had faith, and which is never expressed in this passage, but that's what MacArthur is going to say here. And that saves him because he had faith alone, and that's it. And the other guy is perfectly obedient and should have been justified, but he wasn't because, because perfect obedience can never happen. That I mean, that's the only thing you can conceive what he's saying. All again, to fit a construct from some other voice than Jesus. Okay, so let's read uh, MacArthur's remarks. The parable surely shocked Jesus' listeners. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous, the very definition of self-righteousness. Or let's call that boasting. How about that? Their theological, or let's call it exaltation. Their theological heroes were the Pharisees who held to the most rigid legalistic standards. I'm sorry, that's not true. That's absolutely false. Jesus clearly says in Matthew 15, 6 and Matthew 23, verse 23, the Pharisees were notorious for just teaching tithing and neglecting the weightier matters of the law of mercy, justice or judgments and uh, pistis, which I think meant faithfulness. And that's what's the problem with them. They're very, very, very shallow teachers of God's law. And they are the ones who brought the oral law. And they're also the ones who said the law was given by angels. And they spread that lie because it's not in the Torah. It never says that. It never says that God Yahweh wasn't speaking in Exodus 20. It begins and ends multiple times, four or five times in the middle of Exodus 20. It's Yahweh said this, Yahweh said that, Yahweh says this. That's why uh, the Pharisees are the, uh, called by Jesus as people who are teaching the doctrines of men in the place of the commandments of God. So that's what's wrong with them. They don't, they're very unlegalistic. That's, that's their problem. They're not legalistic. <laughs> that's their, they're anti-law. They're anti-Torah for sure. And if you study their history of where they came from in this 200 BC area era, they were picked by the Greeks who were ruling Judea because they'd conquered Judea and they were favored by them because they were loose, loose about the law, which is favorable to Greek pagan thinking. Anyway, let's go on. So he claims they were the most rigid legalistic. Uh, they held to the most legal, rigid legalistic standards. They fasted, made a great show of praying and giving alms. We don't know anything about them showing a, a show of praying here any different than the publican who's also in the temple at the same time. I don't think Jesus is making that issue here. Giving alms, I guess he means tithing. And even went further in applying the ceremonial laws than, Jesus, than Moses had actually prescribed. Uh, again, that's not in this passage at all, but that means he's admitting that they used an oral law and it's not, it went beyond what Moses had prescribed. It was different from what Moses prescribed. Therefore, they're not following the law. They're anti-Torah. He's just trying to make it sound like they're trying to exceed, uh, they're more even holier than Moses required. Um, all right, I'm going to move to the next quote in this passage to keep for the interest of time and brevity. Uh, so ne then he goes on, he MacArthur says, Jesus supposedly teaches justification by faith alone. This is what he says. Now he, Jesus, astounds his listeners with a parable that seems to place a detestable tax gatherer in a better position spiritually than a praying Pharisee. Jesus' point is clear. He was teaching that justification is by faith alone. Pause. <laughs> Time out. There's no faith alone mentioned here. There's no distinction between these two men of whether one believes in Yahweh and the other doesn't. That's all that would have been the issue at that time. And... Uh, there's no Messiah yet. That's not the real question. So where does he get this idea of faith alone about anything? There's nothing of that in the passage. This is just simply superimposing Pauline theology on top of a parable that has nothing to do with it and actually undermines it. That's what they don't like. Justification by repentance from sin is the antithesis of Paul saying you, if you try to do repentance, that will uh, you'll look good. You're going to change your life and be conforming to God's commandments. That's the That'll lead you to boasting. The exaltation problem that these Pharisees had in this passage. No, 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 it doesn't. Jesus knows that if you have self-control and you aim for hum humility, you won't be sinning and you will be justified. But if you don't have self-control like Paul and other Pharisees and you boast all the time, you end up having the risk of the Pharisees, which is patting themselves on the back of all the great things they do. And, and, and they don't commit sins like other people do. But they actually don't because they're blind. They think they're following God's law, but they've thrown it out 
They threw out the Torah based on the idea that it was given by angels, and then they've replaced it with the oral Torah, which they treat as even at a higher level. So when they use the word Torah, they often mean the oral Torah. And if you read Paul's writings in his epistles, you'll see many times he'll say, as the Torah says, like he, these restrictions on women preaching and teaching, whatever, that's not in the Torah, but he'll say it is, and it isn't there. So he thinks oral Torah is true and superior to the written law of God, which was given by angels. Definitely a Pharisee doctrine. All right. Uh, all right, I'm going to keep going here. All right. What should we conclude about MacArthur's analysis? It's rather simple. MacArthur has set up a false contrast, misrepresenting both figures in the parable. MacArthur has described the publican too narrowly, omitting his repentance activity, and also misdescribed him as saved by faith alone when his faith is never an issue. MacArthur also has falsely depicted the Pharisees perfectly law-abiding, despite A, elements in the parable pointing to claim obedience to tithing, obeying an oral Torah of fasting, which basically is something competing against God's word and basically destroyed God's, eviscerated God's word when this doctrine of the law was brought by angels, that eviscerates the ten, the, the entire Torah, the entire, written, the entire written Torah. It then leaves only left is the oral Torah, because now the only thing that God really gave is the oral Torah, according to Pharisee doctrine. But the written Torah that's given by angels who are weak and begly celestial beings, as Paul says in Galatians 4, 9. Why do you want to be bondage to them? That's what Paul says. Anyway, and then they claim superior to all others because he himself has not committed crimes of extortion or adultery or other injustice. So he's boasting that he hasn't done all these crimes. Well, that's not how you address God when you're coming to him. You don't tell him all the good things you've done. You thank God for all the good he's doing to you. And then you humbly review your life and ask him to forgive you for what you haven't accomplished or help you to accomplish things that you still haven't done that you need to get done or whatever things it is. But you don't, you do it humbly. You do not come to God with an arrogant idea that you're, you're so good and so wonderful. And in fact, Jesus has pointed out the Pharisees are very anti-legalist. They're very pro-oral law. They're very anti-written law. And they basically have negated and done, and done away with the commandments of God. That's in Matthew 15, 6. You've made of none effect, he tells the Pharisees, the commandments of God by virtue of the commandments of men that you have created. That's, that's what he thought about the oral Torah. So basically, you can see Jesus' many contrary lessons of, uh, about the Pharisees were that they were shallow law negators, Matthew 15, 6 to 9, and Matthew 23, verse 23. This false reconstruction of Jesus' parable by MacArthur is clearly visible in table three below. So here I show you the, co the constructs. So justification, Jesus' contrast with MacArthur's. Okay, so here's the left, Jesus, and here's what the right is MacArthur. The publican beat his breast and did not look up to heaven praying, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Pharisee pays his tithe. He fasts twice a week and thanks God for, he's not an adulterer, etc., like the publican over there. Let's look what MacArthur says it is. It's faith alone justifies. The publican is a detestable tax collector. MacArthur does not factor into analysis the repentance from sin characteristic of the publican at all. The Pharisee kept the law flawless and even exceeded to admirable lengths. And, uh, and then he says, this is faith alone. He just says, see that? Just look at these two facts. It proves faith alone and justification by faith alone. When, when faith is not, I can't even mention it because it's not summarized. You can't summarize something that isn't mentioned in, that, in this parable. So this is what you end up with a completely misunderstood. Somebody was a complete 100% misunderstanding of the passage. Let's continue. Go to the conclusion. In this parable of the publican and the Pharisee, Jesus is contrasting a sinner who repents against one who does not. Jesus declares justified a notorious publican tax collector who humbly repents. Jesus declares unjustified a Pharisee who fails to do so and exalts himself. I'm adding a couple little additions. It's that simple. Smug self-righteousness about little points of law and the oral law prevents the Pharisee from repenting. The Pharisee has Pharisees have to abandon their emphasis on the oral law, Matthew 15, verses 6 and 9, and their myopic focus on less weightier matters of the law, such as tithing, Matthew 23, verse 23. Hence, contrary to what MacArthur implies, the publican is not simply a detestable tax collector. Jesus is not declaring justified the tax collectors one who remains detestable with no turning to obey. Nor is Jesus declaring the Pharisee unjustified because the Pharisee is supposedly perfectly obedient but lacks the alleged faith of the publican. Instead, Jesus is squarely differentiating the two based upon the repentance from sin. And, and that most, most emphatically, I want to say, humbly repenting from sin. This differentiation is resisted by the cheap grace gospel because it means Jesus taught justification by repentance from sin and obedience. Humble repentance and, from sin and obedience.
Chief, the Chief Grace Gospel adherents say such a repentance requirement is works righteousness, condemned by Paul as a means toward justification and hence uh, is a false me means of salvation, by, according to Paul. Hence, they adamantly twist Jesus' adoption to conform to faith alone doctrine. However, the parable of the publican and the Pharisee proved justification initiates by repentance from sin, humbly done. It is not by faith alone, nor can an incomplete obedience ever justify. And then I have another heading here. Exaggerated atonement principles cancels Jesus' point. The famous Charles fin Finney points out how some exaggerate the atonement to wipe out Jesus' justification doctrine. Finney explains below that Jesus' atonement only provides the blood that can wash clean another. Nothing else about the animal's life or Jesus' life who died as a sacrifice is imputed. The penitent under the law was not ever excused by sacrifices from repentance or from obeying God. These Now this, by the way, gets back to the prior chapter, which was Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 5, 23 to 24. You cannot, if you go to the altar to bring a sacrifice and atonement, it's an atonement gift, if you do that and you know someone has something against you, Jesus says, you must put the gift down. You can't use it. Got to go back home, work out uh, and, and work and reconcile with the person you've offended, whether it's God or man, doesn't matter. That has to be done. Then once you've done that, then come back and you can bring your atonement sacrifice, but not a moment sooner. That's the same thing what Finney is saying here. These personal behaviors, repentance, and obedience are the means of initial justification. You must do that. You don't. You can't go to give, do atonement. You can't use the blood of Christ until you've done your works worthy of repentance. So that's what puts a po complete kibosh to everything you've heard from Pauline theology. It's totally antithetical to Jesus, and it doesn't it doesn't match the the law and the prophets. Eight times saying the same principle of the I prefer obedience over sacrifice. Finney says anyone who suggests atonement wipes out the need for justifying behavior has made a ludicrous error. Therefore, Charles Finney, the famous attorney turned evangelist, explains below that personal justification is never by atonement alone. To ever think so demonstrates a fundamental misreading of the nature of atonement. Finney is right. Atonement never imputes justification, justification to an unrepentant sinner, just as we proved in the prior chapter. Instead, atonement is only applied upon personal justification. Charles G. Finney wrote in his sermon, Justification by Faith, 1837, as follows. Under the gospel, sinners are not justified by having the obedience of Jesus Christ set down to their account as if he had obeyed the law for them, or in their stead. It is not an uncommon mistake to suppose that when sinners are justified under the gospel, they are counted righteous in the eye of the law by having the obedience or righteousness of Christ imputed to them. This idea is absurd and impossible for this reason, that Jesus Christ was bound to obey the law for himself and could no more perform works of supererogation or obey on our account than anybody else. What is not Was it not his duty to love the Lord his God with all his heart and soul and mind and strength and to love his neighbor as himself? Certainly. And if he had not done so, it would have been sin. The only work of supererogation he could perform was to submit to sufferings that were not deserved. This is called his obedience unto death, and this is set down to our account. But it is, if his obedience of the law is set down to our account, why are we called on to repent and obey the law ourselves? Does God exact double service? Yes, triple service. First, to have the law obeyed by the surety for us, then that he must suffer the penalty for us, and then we must repent and obey ourselves. No, such a thing is no such thing is demanded. It is not required that the obedience of another should be imputed to us. All we owe is perpetual obedience to the law of benevolence. For this, there can be no substitute. If we fail, we must endure the penalty. So in other words, he's saying, more or less, that you have to do your works worthy of repentance, and then the works of Jesus can be imputed to you, but not before then. Anyway, Thus, Finney explains that Christ's righteousness is only a cleanser of sin. It never imputes the very righteousness which is a condition to invoke its application. Jesus obeyed unto death to provide atonement for sin, not to satisfy your personal condition to even ask for atonement, that is, justification by repentance. To say otherwise is to overthrow the principle of atonement. Okay, and here's our concluding paragraph. One who claims atonement gives you justification has wrongly negated Jesus' requirement for justification that you have personal repentance and obedience. If atonement could provide the very same justification necessary to invoke atonement, then you have eviscerated atonement's condition. You thereby will give a false assurance to someone still without atonement that they are justified when they certainly are not justified. Finney astutely proves it could not be otherwise, for then why does Jesus teach justification instead is by repentance from sin in the parable of the publican and the Pharisee? If atonement satisfies that principle of justification, then he says God would be requiring supposedly what Jesus already provides by means of atonement. Hence, it must be that justification depends on your personal repentance from sin and on no substitute for you. Atonement then applies to wash past sins from your account. 
atonement does not satisfy the very condition that Jesus says is necessary to invoke it, personal justification. Thus, Jesus says justification is not by faith, but by repentance from sin. That's the clear message of this passage in Luke. Okay, God bless everybody. That's uh, the end of this chapter two, and we'll pick up with chapter three eventually. Okay, God bless. Take care. Ciao, bye.